Metreon, it's at this point that you realize that the temperature in the room has dropped quite precipitously. You realize suddenly that you're shivering, and as you exhale, you can see small clouds of frosted mist drifting from the breath of each one of your compatriots. Oh, the temperature hell. around you continues to drop, and as it does, you can hear slowly approaching from the other side of the doors the slow echoing of footsteps growing closer and closer, and as they do, you can hear the faint sound of a woman's voice humming, echoing from the corridor. Oh, fuck. What is it? You all hear that, right? Yeah, yeah, it's a... What? Erthrandir looks at the others. I, uh... I don't want to meet whatever, whoever she is, quite frankly, but... Uh, she might be coming towards us. We need to get ready. And that, that he grabs onto Kiva and just roughly shakes her. Yes, yes. What's what is? Uh, are I, we in trouble? What's going on? He puts a finger to his lips and then points to the ice frosting across the window panes and the distant sound of singing. Don't move or move if you want to, but there's something coming. <laughs> all right, all right. Kiva's going to stretch and like all of her bones are cracking and um. She uh, is going to stand and sort of arm herself with her shield and scimitar. Thran Thrandy is going to take a moment to kind of think about what could be causing this cold. Is there any sort of magical phenomena or creature that he could think of that would actually do, that would do the, something like this? Make an arcana check for me. Gotcha. Thirteen. Thirteen. You think to yourself, racking your brains, and nothing immediately comes to mind. And as you do, kind of staring down, finger on your temples, Metreon and Kiva, you glance toward the door as the footsteps approach. The door itself, still reinforced by the vanity before it, the humming moving closer until you can see, on the other side of the stained glass windows, a slender silhouette appearing in shadow stopping on the other side you can see it shifting faintly it's one of its arms is cradled oddly across its chest and then the other reaches forward and you hear the door begin to rattle metreon throws up his hand crossbow uh but backs up away from it uh, corners everybody fine corners and any sort of cover as he is going to erthendir is going to retreat back to squeeze behind the headboard if he can or if there's, like, space there. If there's not, then he'll just stay on the bed. Is there any way you can ping on the map which door is the one that's rattling? It is the one, uh, the second from the left on the bottom. It's the one that Lillison came through the first time. Okay, so Kiva is going to position herself here, sort of kitty corner to the door in case it opens and she can just fucking wail away if anything comes in. Amity pulls Truffle under the bed with her. Um, is Lillison still trancing? I, yeah, yeah, we should wake her up. I... Don't, touch her. Don't touch her. She doesn't like to be touched. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Our personal boundaries are more important than our lives at the moment. At the rattling at the door abruptly both. stops. You watch the silhouette stands there for a moment. The woman's humming still floating through the keyhole of the door and then slowly you watch as the silhouette begins to move away the footsteps slowly retreating the shaking of the door stopping as you step out you notice glancing around the space that as amity previously noticed but might not have shared with the group the door on the opposite side of the corridor, the one directly across from you, appears to now be slightly ajar. It, from best you can remember, it was certainly closed before. 
I don't like that, but the door across the hall is open now. Oh. Oh god, it is. I... Well... I guess we have to check that out. I don't think we have to do anything. I'm just pointing it out to everyone. But usually when doors open of their own accord, that means we don't go inside and investigate. Normally uh, we're not stuck in some sort of bizarre house, haunted house. So I think, frankly, common sense may be out the window at this point. Yeah, I've seen enough horror plays to know that uh, a door opening on its own is not a good sign. So This it is an old house. Right, right. The hinges could just be... Thanks, Lillison. I, I appreciate you keeping us grounded. That was very silly of me. Especially with, with knocking that suit of armor all over the place. Sure, but do we want to remember the fact that that spirit came at us from this direction and bothered us at this door? So maybe the singing lady came from... <sighs> Wait, somewhere in that direction? What happened? Perhaps there oh. was some singing lady who was rattling at the door. I think we should just go downstairs and maybe forget this little third floor adventure. Um, personally, but that's just me. Well, if the monster is on the, in the basement, then uh, we are in the opposite direction of it. Safer, but not closer to the res uh, any kind of resolution here, I suppose. I, I still think we should check this out, but I... I respect y'all's initiative, I suppose. But also, I... I don't know. Uh, I think... Look, Ari, both of us nearly died. I'm aware. A haunted suit of armor. I think we should just try to maybe avoid things that seem like obvious traps. And what are the odds that the way to get out of here is past the obvious traps? If you're designing a place like this, and I think I am leaning towards intentional design here, do you put the exit in a someplace nice and safe, or do you put it past where everyone gets to see all your hard work on torture devices? Why would you put it anywhere? <sighs> to make Let's people think they have a chance? I think we're overthinking this. We need to either leave or, or look at it, but uh, the longer we wait here, the longer th this house gets to figure out new and different ways to torture us. I agree with that. Yeah. I vote we move past, but if Ari really wants to check it out, then I do. do and we'll be and Ari, you go check it out. We'll move past. I... You're not serious. Listen, you want to do it, go ahead and do it. Well, if you insist... If anything bad happens, we'll all be at your back. And he steps forward, looking genuinely hurt, and opens the door. Tate all right, is about you... five feet behind him. Very good. You peer inside, seeing dust and cobwebs that shroud an elegantly appointed bedroom. It appears to contain a large bed, two end tables, and a tall wooden wardrobe. Your eyes squint through the murky gloom of the darkened room. From here, you can make out not much more, though there appears to be another pair of double doors all the way back that appear to lead to perhaps another balcony, as well as another door to the right-hand side, slightly closer to the entrance. There may be more of the room, but from your current position, that's all you can glean. He's going to unsling his bow and step inside all right you step inside peering beyond and you can see now mounted on the wall next to the wooden wardrobe what appears to be a full-length mirror mounted on the wall with an ornate wooden frame with intricate carvings you can see now that the double doors were actually a pair of doors set with panes of stained glass as well as a door to your immediately right that seems to lead to an adjoining chamber and as you turn your head toward the door to the right of you, you can feel the temperature drop and the familiar sound of a soft woman's humming voice emanates from the other side. It's in here. It's... it's in here. Then we shouldn't be. Let's go. 
Close the door and run. Erythrin Deer steps forward. All right, step past it. The humming quiets slightly, though you can still hear it faintly. But the sense of cold you would vanishes. Okay. He so when he stepped forward, the cold lessened somewhat. Correct. It seemed strongest next to that door. Next to the right. Correct. All right. These double stained glass doors seem to have far less of an unpleasant feel to them. He's going to push through those then. All right. They open easily enough if you'd like to open one. Opening the doors and pushing them to look outside, you see a simple balcony similar to the one in the master bedroom overlooking the front of the house. Though you can also see a window, muddy and stained with dirt and age. Though looking through it, you can just faintly see what seems to be a small nursery containing a crib covered with a hanging black shroud. From here, you can see that the crib appears to be swaying slightly. Though by what, you cannot see. Erythrin Deer... It's going to look at the crib, recognition dawning at what is probably going on here. And then he's going to reach out and very gently close that door again. All right. And then return to the hall. I know it's in there. What? What's in there? You remember a little, what were they called? Rose and Thorn? They were talking about their great baby brother. There's a crib in there. Draped with a black sheet. I'm not sure if that means the same things for humans as it does for elves, but... I think it does. It does. It does mean the same for humans. Kiva is trying not to get sick right now. And she backs up closer towards the staircase. It, yeah, and uh, it's a rockin' on its own, so, you know, I think we know uh, part of why this place is a little messed up. I think little's an understatement. Yes, yes it is. It's probably not even real, like, like the other two, right, Metreon? Randy, did you did you put your put your bow? Did you put your hand? Did you touch it at all? Did you see it? A baby I, in there? I saw it. I I didn't see into the crib. I didn't touch it, but I can. Yeah, go for it. Oh, I would say whatever is underneath that shroud that we let it stay there. It, they, Rose and Thorn wanted us to rescue their brother. Maybe this is what we need to do. We take their brother and... I don't know. And do what, exactly? Go outside into the mist and bury it? I... Do you have a better idea? Besides sit here and wait to be die? Poking around with the dead even more. Well, the dead seem to disagree. Because they're poking at us. And he's going to step forward and open the door to the crib. All right, you step forward, opening the door to the chamber beyond. You can see beyond it, a small nursery containing the crib. And as you look inside, the humming immediately stops as the crib slowly shudders and creaks to a swaying stop. Looking inside, you see within a gaunt figure standing over the crib, now suddenly visible, frozen in place. 
Its outline flickers, tinged with an ethereal, translucent glow, and it's only then that you realize that its feet are floating two inches above the ground. Slowly, it turns to face you, revealing the visage of a terrified, skeletally thin young woman. And then with that, a cold gust of wind rushes through the chamber, extinguishing the light that you carry. The apparition gives an unearthly shriek and lurches through the air toward you, clawed hands outstretched. I'll need you to roll initiative for me, please. Okay. 